You are listening to the Salty Witches Podcast. I'm your host, Austin, and of course we have your other host, Mike, here. And tonight we are going to be, uh, our subject is the tools of the witch. This is another rerun or a redo of one of the episodes that we've been working on. Um, And so as you can see, we have various tools and accoutrements here, including a lovely statue of Hecate Trimorphous, um, which is available in the shop if you would like to purchase it. You can't ship it, sorry, just take a flight here. So anyway, how are you doing today, Mike? Um, I'm I'm doing okay. I'm here. Present. Present. Um, before we go into things, we do have a listener question, oh, yes. and it comes from a listener who is also a very loyal student of ours. It mm-hmm. comes from Pamfer. Oh, all right, cool. Um, so Pamfer wants us to talk about portals for a little bit. Oh, okay. Um, this in is what the, Pamphor has to yes, say. Yes, thank you. I would say in the context of what? Good morning, beautiful people. So as I was laying in bed awake last Just night... talking to you. No, not me at all. As I was laying in bed awake last night, as I am so wont to do, I was thinking about the fact that I don't know very much about portals, other than the fact that lightworkers in your area like to leave them lying around open <laughs> and providing a bit of steady <laughs> income for the Cat and Cauldron team. Ah, <laughs> so she listened to that episode. Is that <laughs> anything you guys might be interested in discussing? Thanks for all you do. So, yeah, portals are a thing, and we do have a tendency to get called in to close aforementioned portals. When in reality, it's usually just some funky, fucked up energy that someone's left behind. I'll yeah. let Mike go ahead and go with this because Pamphers more. Um, oh, oh, it's taking all, more of your classes. all the pressure. Um, I, I would agree with what you were just saying there. That in most of the time, I think when people have uh, something like a portal happening in a space, it, it really depends. It's not what they would m- most of us would would identify as a portal. It really is just like a lingering energetic funk. That's all it is. And those those things can, uh, certainly they can mess with the energy in a space, but it wouldn't be considered like an, like an active portal. Um, though it can get tricky to distinguish sometimes. And I think that a lot of people are, um, they, they struggle to be able to identify like actual portal phenomena when it's, when it's going on because they're not really intelligent kinds of energetic things. Like it really is kind of just a residual. Like you think of your door, right? Your door is not an intelligent thing in and of its own. It's basically just an opening for other things that might be intelligent to come and go. Right. Um, so it can be tricky to distinguish. Um, Portals are interesting, though, as they do occur, um, and portals, I I want to say, more often than not, are really kind of just, they're just naturally occurring kinds of things. Most of the time, I think, when people become aware of a portal uh, of some sort, that um, it's really, to be honest, it's probably something that's been there for a very long time, and they just were not really consciously aware of it prior um, the only other incident that, that we've seen, and I believe uh, that, that Panther was um, uh, mentioning specifically is situations where we see spiritual practitioners of whatever kind doing um, whatever their work may be, right? And in the process of doing that work, they are doing some pretty intense uh, evocation or invocation. Like they're, they're basically doing conjuration and summoning work. Um, with maybe without realizing what's going mm. on. And anytime that we are in the process of, of basically issuing an invitation to spirit of some sort, there there has to be uh, some sort of energetic bridge. There has to be a way for that spirit to get to from wherever it was to where we need it to be, right? That's one of the reasons why we see uh, the significance or the importance of like uh, barrier kinds of sigils or seals in a lot of magic is we need to make sure that as we're opening or creating an an opening of some sort that we're then able to contain that opening, right? Um, So that does happen, uh, I think, a lot of times unconsciously uh, or um, yeah, not, well, we'll say, uh, it's not done deliberately. We'll say that, right? The creation or the um, the opening of a portal that would then be, you know, kind of just left. Um, something again that we see a lot of New Age practitioners doing. Yes, because yes. they they like to think that they're calling in angels when they do their their Reiki and their healing work. Though I just want to go on record, though I am not a Reiki practitioner. This one is, um, and he will tell you right now that angels have nothing to do with Reiki. Nothing um, to do with but Reiki. Lightworkers, 
lightworkers and new age practitioners like to call in what they think are angels to help them with their healing work a lot of the time. Um, and it's, it's tricky that, and that to be honest is really an entirely own its own conversation. Um, but simply put the spirits that they're calling in more often than not, yeah, those aren't angels. There's definitely something else going on there. Uh, but they're typically a little too arrogant to be able to do the research to really learn and figure out what's going on. Um, Anyway, but they call these spirits in, um, and in the process, uh, either through or usually, usually through a combination of the practitioner's energy and intent, and then the energy coming from spirit that has been summoned, there usually is, again, kind of a bridge that is established, um, and that's where we see the creation of a portal. Um, now, depending on how that works, depending on the effective practice of the, of the, the human in that scenario, and if they understand that after I've done something like this, I need to make sure that I send this energy away. I need to make sure that I close this portal because they don't, right? They don't do this, right? Because it's an angel, right? It can stick around. It's an angel, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, there's no need to send this spirit away. It's an angel and they're all love and light. Um, but uh, so they don't do anything to to close kind of their side of the door. And if the spirit that they have called in is really not what it claims to be, and it's something that, you know, maybe isn't a malicious kind of a spirit, it just kind of wants to hang around, right, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. right, it's not going to close its side of that doorway either, right? And so you are left with this residual opening or portal. Um, and that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, and portal, um, in, the, uh, in those kinds of situations, at least. A real portal can actually happen in magical practitioners' um, spaces as well, and especially mm -hmm. when you have repetitive ceremonial magic or repetitive ritual happening um, where you're calling up your spirits and you're doing this, that, and the other. It's almost like it creates a rift in the energy of the area, and that mm -hmm. rift just kind of, I don't want to say hemorrhages, but it just continuously kind of has this back and forth feel. Um, and if you're a practitioner, you know what you're doing, then sometimes that's what you want. Other times you don't want that. Um, so now that we've kind of told our listeners and viewers now um, what portals are, what are some very practical ways to close them? Because I'm going to actually go ahead and tie that into our podcast episode, which is tools. Okay. Um, I like to use um, blades to close portals. Mm -hmm. The blade in traditional witchcraft, um, a lot of people say, it's to command spirits. It's not. Yeah, you never command spirits. It's not to command spirits. Um, what it is, um, a lot of people look at this and they think, oh, it's an athame or a athame or athame. Does anybody know the root of that word? I don't know. Other I'm, than just pretentious Wicca bullshit? It's, it's, it's mainly in Wicca. But in traditional witchcraft, this would be considered a spirit blade or a knife. And yes, this one is sharp because a okay. knife should be sharp. Oh, don't be waving that around. A knife should be sharp. Its whole means is to cut. But the blade in traditional witchcraft is used to set boundaries a lot of the time. And so a lot of the time what happens when you've opened a portal or there's a portal there, there's a lack of boundary. And so utilizing the blade to energetically mark a boundary and then push that boundary in and close that rift is something that is really good to do. Again, if you are someone who's just barely started out on your journey and you can barely ground yourself, probably don't go opening portals, probably don't go well, trying most to... Most of the time, though, people, I don't think they're... I don't think people... More often than I don't think they consciously are opening a portal. Well, of course not. But for those of you who try, or if you're still not as confident in your practice as you around energy work as you would like to be, probably don't try and go over to your friend's house and close a portal. If there is a portal there, just because you could end up making things worse, or you could just end up containing it, and then there's just going to be an odd, weird, funky energy yeah, in that that's, one corner that's of the a room. Very all the time. good point. Yeah, you usually don't want to close a portal until you've had a chance to make sure that whatever came through it is back on the other side. Yeah, because at that point, you can do as much cleansing as you want, but all you're doing is kind of pushing that energy out or letting it have more good energy to feed off of. If it's a parasite, um, sometimes it's just, it's just like, what the fuck? Like, I want to go home. Yeah, a lot of times those spirits don't know what's going on anymore than the human in that situation Exactly. Does. And so I'm just waving around an athame right now. And yeah, I you should probably put that so down. Awesome. Um, this is also available in the shop. Not for shipping. Um, unfortunately. Um, but so with this, um, 
you want to make sure that that spirit is put back where it came from, back through that portal, that space, whatever it is, which kind of gets us into the subject of banishment, um, which you actually covered in last week's episode on your own. Uh, did I? Yes, you did. Ah, that seemed like that that episode a week ago seems like it was a year ago. Yes, I know. The days are just busy, busy, long, long days blending together. So that's one of the first tools. And traditionally, um, with your spirit blade, um, it would be used for practical things. It'd be used to cut things. Uh, a lot of practitioners are like, no, your blade's not supposed to cut things. It's a it's it's a fucking knife. It's a knife. It should cut things. And that's my opinion. Well, I think that's that's a distinguishing thing or feature, I think, to the tools as they are. And this is a good thing for us to discuss because we're talking about tools tonight. Um, but I think that you're going to find very different mindsets mm-hmm. around the use of something like a ritual dagger in, say, like ceremonial magic. Yes, ceremonial. Where it, where or it Wicca. is typically it is purely ceremonial. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, a lot of a lot of ceremonial magic. Really, to be honest, and this is probably one of the reasons why. And I'm not I'm not trying to, to shit on ceremonial magic because it's oh, good stuff, yes. but probably a little bit but uh but i'll do it ceremoniously um but uh, a lot of ceremonial magic is really primarily it's just the pomp and the show you know um and so i think that you can have something like a really ornate a very pretty not very sharp not super practical dagger mm-hmm. ritual dagger when you are working as a high ceremonial magician but as a witch or as a folk practitioner you need that dagger to be able to cut things yes and it's going to get bloody and it's going to get dirty yep. and you know and so i think that's the the kind of the difference in the idea behind the tool or the purpose of the tool yes um i mean you would go out and you would harvest your your herbs with your knife mm-hmm. not your bowline bowline or bowline is uh, again a little bit more Wicked. Um, again, nothing wrong with that. The white handled knife, as it's called. Um, and so, so in traditional witchcraft, on the other hand, um, or folk witchcraft, your knife is usually going to be sharp because you use it for practical things as well as magical things. Um, one of the readers in the shop, George, uh, who's also a practitioner, um, has even said like, "Oh yeah, no, like I left my blade." at my friend's house or I left it over at my parents' house and I was like, oh shit, I need something. So he grabbed his favorite kitchen knife and was like, okay, this is going to work. Yep. And that's, that's what you do. Yep. Practicality. Yep. So um, anyway, back to, to to portals really quickly. Though. Let's close that. Let's close that out. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> so um, so this is that's kind of some of the information on, on how they occur. Um, don't be fearful of portals. Uh, they, they really, to be honest, we're surrounded by those kinds of things all the time, just like many other kinds of spiritual phenomena and, and intelligences. Um, the, the main thing that you want to make sure that you are in control of when it comes to portals is, is really primarily the kind of traffic moving through them. Um, and you can effectively control that by maintaining a good spiritual hygiene routine mm-hmm. in your space. Um, if you do find that you come across a portal, it is, uh, for whatever reason, allowing problematic kinds of things into a certain space. There, there are many methods to close those. Yes. Um, yeah. And, uh, I mean, you can use something as simple as a tool. One that I talk about or that I share have, have shared uh, pretty commonly actually involves, um, usually like the crafting of some sort of seal or sigil that would have something to do with like weaving together or closing, um, and placing that over the physical space or near in, in the physical space nearest to the portal that you can get. Um, beyond that, taking other things that are associated with banishing or the removal of energies, clearing and cleansing of energies. And um, what I typically will do is I'll, I'll move in like a counterclockwise direction and kind of like spiral that energy down to a point um, to kind of basically like kind of like close down that energy a little bit. Um, and that was something that was taught to me many years ago by one of my teachers. Mm-hmm. Um, but I found that actually over the years to be very effective. Yeah, it's very effective. Um, yeah. So we can uh, maybe, maybe maybe we'll have to find a way to um, share some additional practical information on, on the closing of portals uh, at another time. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, we, so we talked about the knife. Um, the tools in, in, in the art of witchcraft are not necessarily needed, but they are fun little things, and they're going to be things that are going to be practical and things that you have pretty much lying around everywhere. Um, uh, what you see on the table are some, well, for those of you who are watching, um, what you see on the table um, are some some common tools you'll find. Um, and again, these are tools that you find in other various traditions that just kind of like go through that all. So what Mike is holding right now is a wand. 
Um, again, these are made by a local crafter, actually. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's maple? Maple. Yes. Yeah. So wands uh, are used almost as an extension of yourself. They're used as an extension of your finger or as your body. Um, in some traditions, they're associated with fire. In other traditions, they're associated with water. Uh, not water, air. Um, and <laughs> water, it's fine. It was all. <laughs> um, but with... With wands in particular, I've never been a big wand person, actually. And I find that you have been more of a wand individual. I, I So I will utilize wands depending on the nature of the work that I'm doing. You mentioned a moment ago that tools, as we incorporate them into witchcraft or folk magic or whatever, whatever it is we're doing, that tools are um, not necessary. But I also want to say at the same time that they are kind of, at least certain tools. Mm -hmm. Okay, but something like a wand, I'm going to say, for me, and, and for at least a majority of the other practitioners that I, I'm familiar with, wands would be certainly considered an optional kind of a tool. Yes. The benefit to a wand, I think, for most people is that it, it really, I think, for a lot of people, helps you kind of get there psychologically. Yeah. Right? Like, there's something kind of cool about being able to... Careful, you're going to knock out Ashley. Don't, don't. What? Well, I wasn't. I was. I wasn't intentionally casting anything. Like it was. It wasn't a full on like. Like I was about like, to see sparks. Like, Crucio. Ah! Daddy. Now we're gonna get sued by a turf. Um. <clears throat> anyway. Uh. So. Anyway, but so for me, this would be kind of like a you know, if you want it and it's fun, or you're part of a tradition or a practice that emphasizes something like this, go for it, because it can help you kind of make the difference in your brain mm -hmm. between like this, which is like, well, this is just me. There's no power here, right? Or, you know, something like this, right? Where you're like, this is magic. This is powerful, right? Uh, um, this is wood. The other, the other. Speaking of wood, <laughs> the other benefit to something like this is in many traditions, there's a belief or an idea that the type of wood that you would uh, craft or that you would see a wand made from would. Uh, uh, would allow you, I keep saying wood in the wrong, wrong kind of wood, but now I've got the giggles that it's stupid. Um, that you're this, allowed to have the, giggles. the type of, the type of wood would allow you to, uh, work with the plant spirit yes. of that particular tree, right? Like the idea that this is maple, there's a belief or kind of an idea in some traditions that by working with this and by connecting with this, through my, my my personal spirit and my, my work that um, that I could potentially call upon the spirit of maple as a as a plant ally mm -hmm. in my work yeah and that that spirit could potentially help me to direct energy with this yeah um, I mean you see that in a lot of different things as well I mean um, one of the tools that you'll find in traditional Cornish craft in particular um, or the UK traditions is the stang um, the, the stain stang. Like you stained your shirt? No, stang. S T A N G. Yes, I know. But for the benefit of our our uh, our, what do we call them now? We can't really say listeners. I mean, I guess they're all listening to our us patrons. technically. But our your salty witches. Our salty Salties. witches. Yes, our salty. Uh, for the uh, our, our, our saltines. Our saltines. Um, yes, our for the, switches. For the benefit of our, I think I prefer saltines. No, saltines. Switch, switch conveys a totally different kind That's of an a appropriate Austin. kind of a thing. So our for our saltines, I love uh, that. we are, are now known um, as saltines. There you go. Um, we are. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. What was I going to say? For the benefit of you who are wasting your time with this nonsense with us this evening. Um, uh, I lost it. I'm done. Stang. So a stang is a ritualistic staff. Um, uh, it's usually two-pronged. Okay, so think of it almost like a pitchfork. Um, and it is used to symbolize um, the old the old witch gods in Cornish craft. So it's used to symbolize uh, the Bukadu or the Bukadir. Like horned gods, right? Yeah, horned yeah, gods. Because that's, like, that's like, the, like the top is like a... Yeah. So, whoop, like you got horns. Yeah. Um, and you'd actually, um, you can find those out in nature just with how, how some trees fall or uh, twigs fall. Just do not cut them from a, a living tree. No, they have to be fallen. Um, or, or a lot of the times, uh, witches would have taken a pitchfork 
um, and they would have just removed the middle two sting, the middle two prongs. Um, and what it is is it's meant to represent the horns, as we know, as we've talked about in previous podcasts. Horns represent higher knowledge, knowing. Um, you would place a candle between it, um, and it would function as the axis mundi for. Um, for your workings. So it would usually be in the center. You use it to cast a compass round, even though I don't know if corner switches did compass rounds in the ancient days, but they do now. Um, what is Axis Mundi? The Axis Mundi is the world tree or the, the pillar on which witches travel. So it's the idea of like, it connects the underworld the middle world and the upper worlds. And by going through and accessing the Axis Mundi, um, you can have spirit flight so you can go to the sabbath so, okay so, okay, okay, okay. okay, so like my, my i'm understanding from what you're sharing right now in educating us all on the axis mundi that santa claus sits at the top of the axis mundi which indeed does guarantee that he is a wizard slay because that's right right like north pole to south pole right like is that kind of what we're talking about it extends beyond the physical barriers. Oh, whatever. You know anyway. <laughs> um, so so it represents the Axis Mundi and is effectively the altar. So um, it's used to gather in Cornish traditions and Old English traditions what's called sprawl or power. Um, you'll usually walk with it, and it's traditionally made of uh, ash, the ash wood. Um, so that's one of the ritual and tools. Put it, and you put a nail in the bottom. Yes, and you, you, you hood it. Um, I do believe it's called. Well, hooding is the top thing and now i can't remember like the bottom so you so you you place a a, a metal spike yes or, it creates or a, a large nail the in the bottom the and it's uh well it's also supposed to help with conductivity mm -hmm. because the the metal is is conductive mm -hmm. so the idea is that that completes kind of like a circuit mm -hmm. from yeah so so stings are pretty cool um they're um they can be imposing in ritual, particularly when you are doing public ritual and you have a bunch of people who've never experienced ritual mm -hmm. and you walk into the room and you bust out like a, a six foot tall, like staying, we're going to do some magic that has like yeah. a, a, a goat skull on it. I want to stay with a gold skull on it. Shh, you have a birthday coming up. All right. What else do we have? Uh, <laughs> what else do we have? Uh, in, the, in the realm of magical tools. One that is really, really important that is, in my opinion, necessary is a cauldron. Or a, yeah, that, or that was the one for sure. Bowl. I was like, this one's necessary. Okay. Um, so the cauldron, obviously, I'm, I'm talking a lot on this podcast. Not, not, a, not a cauldron necessarily, but like something to hold fire. Yes. Specifically. A fireproof container of sorts. There you go. Um, so like, you know, like your, your old Tupperware. Yeah. Pyrex. There you go. Or a cast iron, a Dutch Pyrex oven. This would be Dutch really oven. good. Oh God, I'd, I'd be terrified though. I'd be like, I'm, I, you can't really, you can't find that shit anymore. If you broke your Pyrex during a ritual. That would be just disastrous. Horrible. Actually, it would heat uneven, so it probably explode. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Storing we away don't, for we don't want, like, no exploding glass. That's not good. We only get burned with rock salt in our coven. <laughs> that happened once. So cauldrons. Yeah, you go ahead and talk about cauldrons, Mr. So Sassy Pants. Cauldrons are, I think, really important uh, tools, you know, and I am talking about cauldrons specifically, okay? And while I said a moment ago that I think this is necessary, really, it doesn't need to be a cauldron, okay? Um, really, it just needs to be something that will allow you to safely work with or more safely work with fire. Fire is a prime elemental force in most magical traditions. Mm -hmm. It uh, creates, it illuminates, it destroys. Uh, it, also, it also has the ability to transmute or it is believed that it will transmute energy because it can take something physical and turn mm -hmm. it into something etheric right it illuminates and casts um, shadow yes so uh fire is uh, very significant and so you will probably want to have something that will help you to safely work with fire um cauldrons are uh powerful tools i think for most practitioners for a couple of other reasons as well because the cauldron in and of itself can represent so much um, in many traditions, the cauldron is seen as kind of a representation of uh, of potential, or of what someone maybe uh, would consider kind of the um, the uh, what I'm trying to say the womb of the goddess, I guess, or maybe like the womb of creation, right? Like the idea of of this empty vessel, right? Uh, but what 
what potentially comes out of it mm-hmm. as we as we put in, right? We put in our, our, who knows, right? Whatever we're putting in, right? And then ultimately the effect of our spell or our ritual, right? Is what comes out, right? Is kind of the idea. So cauldrons are our methods for really kind of birthing our magic or for uh, giving uh, power to to our will and our intent. Um, so, so there is that. Uh, cauldrons also are excellent for containment. Um, and so they can be really effective tools for holding and binding um and uh people or spirits um yeah so i don't know but i would say this would be a good thing to make sure you have on hand i want you to turn that upside down the cauldron the cauldron oh okay and put it flat okay in some traditions when you do that it actually represents uh the mound of death or old burial mounds so for some traditions, um, they would actually work with that if they're working with ancestral mm-hmm. spirits to really connect to the uh, underworld. Yeah. There, along the lines of, of that, um, because I'm a wicked witch, um, this is a really cool way to like work baneful magic on someone. You basically like put them under, kind of for that same reason. Like when they're under your cauldron, your cauldron is upside down and it's over the, your tag lock or your witness item for whoever that person or situation may be. Like they're they're now like believed to be fully within your power or cut away, right, from the external world. So, yeah, it's a little tidbit. I'd also heard that there was significance to the position of the handle. Um, and I, that is specific to particular traditions, mm-hmm. but I know that in a lot of... Uh, conversations that I've had with different practitioners that um, over the years I've heard that um, a lot of people like covens witches will use uh, the position of their handle like if the handle's up and over the cauldron or if it's kind of down like kind of lay into the side like they often do um, when it's up that is something that they'll do like they'll flip the candle or the, the handle up um, to kind of let spirits know like like we're soon to start working okay right? Um, and then when the work actually begins, it's like, okay, now we're at work, right? Kind of the idea they put it down. Interesting. Right? So, yeah. Cool. There's a lot going on with cauldrons. So the more you know. Yeah. Um, okay. But do they need a cauldron? They could use like a cast iron pan, right? Yeah, if yes. it was, if it had a little bit of depth. Yeah. Right? They could use uh, a Dutch oven. Yep. Dutch ovens Which are Which actually... I always thought was like when like you were in bed with someone and they farted and they like pulled the covers oh, up over your head. I thought that was a Dutch oven for years and years Same and years. Thing. Is it? Well, it, because you put a lid on top of it and it's like sealed. Yeah. And it heats up. So okay. Like, so they are both Dutch ovens. They are both Dutch ovens. But the Dutch oven is one also... Is big one is like metaphoric. One okay. Is okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm going to cook you breakfast tomorrow and I'm going <laughs> to use my Dutch oven. Uh, Lord. Jesus. Um, okay, don't, so don't bring him into this. All right. Um, <clears throat> Dutch ovens are actually really, really cool. Um, they're they're great because um, you could have a cauldron that's just for holding flame and fire, and then you could actually have a Dutch oven and actually use that to cook like part of the coven or the company's meal. Yes. So that's one of my favorite things about them. Okay, so. <clears throat> We've talked about co- uh, covens. We've talked about wands. We've talked about blades. We've talked about cauldrons. What else do we need to talk about in terms of tools? I have a couple more things up here. Um, also, microphones. Some of them are just for microphones. Yes. The magical practice of use of microphones. They amplify your voice out to the ethers. We do. Well, you just don't know who's on the other end, right? Exactly. I don't need a microphone. It's dangerous magic. We should go. It's probably fair, actually. Actually. Um, um, actually. Something that you'll also find a lot in traditional covens or traditional witchcraft practices is actually a skull. Um, skulls represent death, obviously. They represent mortality. Um, the In some covens, it would actually be like the skull of like the founder of their tradition um, or like a skull of one of the members of uh, one of the family members or something. Um, and hmm. what? I'm just thinking about that now. Like... Trying to think of like my ancestors or like the coven ancestors, like whose skull would I want to keep? Mine. You want to keep my skull? Go on. But um, it's used to actually 
function as a vessel for um, spirits and communication. Mm -hmm. Um, traditionally, you'd have the skull, but then you'd also have bones crossed in front. Um, and that's to symbolize, like, it is closed. We are not talking. And then as you open it, it's this idea that, like, oh, the road is now open. Okay. Um, I like to be to clear, though, the skull doesn't need to be, like, actual bone. No, right? it doesn't. I mean, uh, I mean, finding a real human skull. It's a vessel. Yeah. It's a vessel. You know, yeah. these are fairly hollow, I do believe. Um or, well, this is resin. Yeah, and we have this here as a, as kind of just as a, what would you call it, a an example? Yes, a prop. A prop. Yes. Um, I really like that skull actually because it has the stone cool. on it. Some, yeah. Like a steak knife situation. Uh, exactly. Yeah, like. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, in a pinch. What do What do you th have you heard about like the whole like you should drill a hole in it? I have kind of thing. I, I have. Um, some people call it tapping the bone. Yeah. Um, what would, What would be the point of that? It's believed in some traditions that the spirit or spirits enter through the, the base of the skull, mm -hmm. the occipital lobe. Yes. Um, and so because of that, um, when you just have the skull, by drilling a hole in the back of it, it helps kind of like, here, enter here. It's its doorway, gotcha. basically. And you can breathe life into it. Um, sometimes you'll also like drill holes in the eyes. Yeah. Um, the eye sockets of, of like these resonance skulls yeah. to make it a little bit more um, lifelike. Um, and so that and they can, can see you. Put your weed in there. Yes, you can, in fact, put your weed in there. I always want to put googly eyes at my skull. Oh, God, that would be awesome. I think googly eyes should definitely be more, a more consistent inclusion in magical practice. Now I'm just envisioning the Secretary statue with googly eyes, and yeah. I think it's hilarious, actually. I do not see a problem, and she has a, a wonderful sense of humor. I'm sure she would totally enjoy it as well. <laughs> um, but that's what skulls would be for. Um, Alas, poor Yorick. To be or not to be? That is the question. Whether it is, is nobler in the mind. Why is that the question? I don't know. Um, anyway, so skulls are, are really cool things. But again, you're going to find primarily that skulls are um, going to be... Skulls are going to be... Um, really kind of specific to, I think, just a few traditions, to be honest. Like, they're not really too common. Um, are you okay? Hmm. We had visitors. <clears throat> Human people incapable of reading store hours on Google visitors. Um, anyway, what else do we have? We have, uh, let's talk about this. <laughs> Let's talk about this. We've got it. We I totally skipped over the altar pattern, but uh, but I'll be honest. I think the altar pattern is something that is again very particular to certain traditions. It is the altar pattern is um, essentially used to act as a focal point for charging. Um, a lot of the times, it's a pentacle and it's representative of Earth, um, and it's basically used to kind of like pull the energy and give a focus. Um, so altar patterns are cool. Yeah. I have one on my altar. It's a pentacle and it's made of soapstone. I burn candles on it. Yes. Pretty. It's pretty. It's lovely. It takes me back to my old Wicca days and I'm like, I will keep you because I like you. Aesthetically, I love it. Well, and I mean, and it's just, it's shiny. And I think we are, as magical practitioners, we are always part crow and uh, we love shiny. I don't know what you're talking about. I always think of like the crow from The Secret of Nim and he's like, you have a Sparkly. Jeremy. Yes, oh, Jeremy. Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, it was Jeremy. Yeah, I love Jeremy. I have a sparkly. Don't look at it. All right. So, statuary. Not this statuary specifically. Okay. Uh, or this statue specifically. Excuse me. This is a, as Austin mentioned at the beginning of the episode, uh, and then we, I realize those of you at home who are listening, not watching, but you cannot see, but this is a depiction of the triple form Hecate. Hecate um, Trimorphous. Yes, who is not the triple goddess or, or the maiden mother crone. No, 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 no. Uh, but uh, any statue, any iconography, any depiction of spirit, deity, whatever it may be, right? These can also be uh, important tools for us to mm -hmm. utilize in our magical and ritual work, right? And why, why would that be? Part of it's because it's a vessel. And so you'd be actually calling a spirit into it. Um, another part of it is because... Um, this is how one of my old uh, 
friends used to talk about their statues is they know that the god is not here but because it's an artistic representation of said spirit or god um that means someone was in connection with that and it's like a phone line Hmm. i'll I'll buy that it's like a physical egregore of okay. the god or the goddess or the spirit. Well, I mean, you know, that makes sense, right? I mean, if we believe in, in deities specifically, you know, there's kind of an understanding that they are, you know, they're kind of omni, omnipotent, omnipresent, mm-hmm. right? So who knows? There could be like a tiny piece of, of Hecate's consciousness. Yeah. I mean, so once like, you wake although, it up. Although I will say, like, looking at the majority of the statuary that's produced these days for different gods and goddesses, if, like, Hecate were to pop into the room and go, like, I, I, I firmly believe, I firmly believe, she'd be like, I hate that statue! Like, looks nothing like me, right? That's kind of how I feel she would often respond. Even for the Triforma. So, it's a beautiful statue, but, um, you know, but I, I don't know. I, I think really what my, my, my hitch here is that, like, it seems like these days that all of the statues are sculpted by straight men and they all have like you know like enormous boobs and you know but still somehow like really tiny emaciated little waists you know like what you gave her huge tits but she doesn't have hips excuse me what um you know and so it just seems to me that like like i'm like i see a lot of these and it's always like you know like like if it were a statue like aphrodite wonderful great right yeah make her curvy make her hippie give her big boobs whatever right um but you know but like like hecate or like you know, like a lot of other goddesses, mm-hmm. where they're like super Diana. sexualized, like Diana or Athena. I've seen some really sexy depictions of Athena, it's and I'm like, odd. excuse me, who sculpted this shit? You know, obviously straight men with you know a lot of free time on their hands and a very active imagination. Probably good they're sculpting because now I'm thinking what else they could be doing with their hands, and that's even more disturbing. But uh, anyway, so yeah. Back but, to statues. But they're 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 a vessel, but they're also used as a focus, a mental and physical focus for you. Yeah. Which honestly is what all the tools are for. All the tools are for uh, they are a physical focus for you. Um, on top of that, if you believe in animism, which most witches do, most traditional witches do. Um, now you have to explain to us really quickly what animism is. Animism is the belief that everything has um, a spirit and its own kind of personality and thing like that, right? Mm -hmm. So the spirit of Carnelian, this Carnelian flame right here, is the same spirit of all the other Carnelian that is out there, but the spirit of Carnelian is fiery and very confidence boosting and stuff like that. I've not ever had someone hold Carnelian and go, I just feel so at peace and sleeping. And if they do, I'm like, wow. You're lacking a lot of fire, or you have too much. And the Carnelian's like, oh boy. No. We're going to tamper that down. Um, But it's the belief that everything um, in nature has its own spirit. So the spirit of rosemary is the spirit of rosemary. If it's the rosemary here or the rosemary in your garden, it doesn't matter. It's the spirit of rosemary. So that's what animism is. Did I cover that? Um, Sure. Do you want to clarify anything there? No. No, you're doing really well. Cool. Rock on. Ave Satanas. Uh. Okay. Anubis has your nose. Anubis has your nose. Anubis has your nose. There you go. Anyway, so, but that's, that's, that's <laughs> the idea, is that um, each thing has its own spirit. So obviously the spirit of the knife is going to be pointy, stabby, sharp. The spirit of the cauldron is going to be warm or cold and open and dark and vast. The spirit of maple versus the spirit of willow. They're a little bit different. Maple mm-hmm. has a little bit more of a sturdy fill. Willow's a little bit more like, I'm a tree in the wind, just hanging out, loving life. That was a very Nell moment right there. Uh, that's what I was going for. Hey, in the wind. That was a very he- heavy movie. Yes, it was. Thank you. Jeez, Austin. Now my whole evening was totally bummed out now. Um, ugh. I'm sorry. I Good performance, everything. though. Jodie Foster is amazing. It's true. Good actress. I miss her. She doesn't do much anymore. Yeah. Um, anyway, let's talk about a couple of other things um, that might, again, maybe be a bit more secure, but things that I think pop up consistently enough, okay. particularly in, in pop culture depictions of these kinds of practices that I think people are kind of like, hmm, what's that? Um, what is a ritual chord or a singulum? So a ritual chord or a singulum, um, there are several purposes for it. Okay. So a singulum 
um, is used in usually red thread traditions. Um, and I have to explain what a red thread tradition is. A red thread tradition is a tradition where it is believed that you are innately born as a witch and that you share witch blood. It's also initiatory. It has to be initiated. Um, but the witch cord uh, serves a very practical purpose um, and a lot of practices, and it's to mark out your working space. Okay. It's to mark it out your working space. To, and to bind. It also helps to bind. Like, you'd basically use it for the same things that you would use just, like, a normal cord. For, um, right? It all, yes, and it also yeah. helps keep your robes on. That's, well, unless you're working skyclad and then robes off. Yes. Um, but that's what a ritual quarter singulum is. And in some traditions, it is because you will receive your singulum at the time of initiation. Um, it is believed that usually because it's traditionally white, it is a symbol of that thread of spirit and knowledge and power that you are passing down to your student or your mm-hmm. initiate. And so. So all y'all Shabari witches, make sure you have a, a, a good long singulum. Um. We, we have uh, our, our assistant here, uh, our assistant, our producer, our director, our director here. Our manager. Um, she, she, she wears many hats, um, has given us some, some additional party favors. Let's talk about this one for sure, because this is one that is similar to a cauldron, I think, but also very different. Well, chalices obviously represent the male anatomy. Um, really? Yeah. Is that because you... you Put your, it's your... belly buttons. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Masculine belly buttons only. Uh, yeah. Pepperoni belly buttons, really. Well, there should be a lot more lint in that thing. So anyway, um, no, they represent, uh, again, the goddess. Um, in some more modern traditional practices in groups, you would see that this would be used to perform the great rite with. Um, the great rite... I keep saying things and I'm like, oh, I have to explain it now. So the great rite and traditional Wicca and some traditional craft is, and high ceremonial magic and high ceremonial magic is the act where the high priest and the high, the high priest and the high priestess uh, perform ritualistic sex. Um, now, because we've gotten into an era where we don't necessarily want to do that. Um, you masculine, this phallus, this yoni, I puppy. Okay. Okay. Well, um, one thrust. <sighs> Men are the worst. So, anyway, go on. So that's what that's what this would represent. It's obviously it has a practical. It's a practical thing. It's to hold your drink, and which is like to drink. And you like yeah, to drink. You can put your Kool Aid in there. You can put your Kool Aid in there. You can put. I you like know, blue. It's the best flavor. I like red. So, but that's, it's practical. It is a vessel of holding. So it's going to hold your liquids. It can hold an oil. It can hold um, a potion. If you're working with something like that, like a flying potion or something like that. Um, Have multiple chalices or goblets if you're going to use them for anything other than like something you would drink. Yes. um, So that you don't risk poisoning yourself. Yes, this is a very pretty chalice actually. It has a tree on it. It has a nice Mm -hmm. color combo. My cat does a good job. Okay. All right, let's let's talk about a mortar and pestle, which really, to be honest, I think is just another version of what you were just talking yes. about, right? Because we have mortar or heavy stone vagina, <coughs> and we have pestle, which is heavy stone penis. Um, and when you put these two together, you grind things with them, right? Or you use the combination of the energies of what's in here and the physical force and movement to create, right? Is kind of the idea, right? At least from the perspective of folk or witchcraft. Yeah. You know, like if you're an herbalist and you heard me say that, you would probably be just like just totally just freaked out right now. But um, but yeah, but but these are also potentially like this, at least in particular, is absolutely something that could certainly double as a cauldron, mm-hmm. right? Maybe it wouldn't hold fire, but would hold other shit. You could right? burn things in it. And if you put sand in it and a charcoal, then it would hold. It would hold. That's um, true. It would hold heat very well, and you that's, could burn incense or herbal matter on it. That's yeah. very true. Yeah, and then Ashley did bring us some other fun little things. Yes, yeah, so I totally we have. Us, yeah. uh, we have lucky rabbit's feet, which rabbit's feet have been used in folk traditions for a long time. So it kind of looks like it's giving you the finger. It does. Don't we love it? Um, so yeah, rabbit's feet. Secret message. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ashley just flipped us off. No, yeah, that's okay. Not the first or last. I've been, I've been a pope today, so it's probably just as well. That's fine. So rabbit's feet are used for luck. 
Um, in some conjure traditions, actually, you would anoint this with Van Van oil, and um, what it would do is it helps change your look around. Um, rabbits are also really, really fast. Um, they're usually very smart. They can jump from one place to another, so it also helps add mm -hmm. speed to spell work. Yeah. And I have a gator paw. Um, um, and I do want to be very clear. Like These, again, would be ritual items to incorporate into sure. work that would not necessarily, maybe not necessarily be considered tools, although maybe, um, depending on what you're doing in your tradition. Um, and, and again, certainly items of choice, right? Like I love the people that come in that are like really not overly experienced with a lot of different kinds of like, uh, like ethno magical practices mm -hmm. or, um, like, uh, just, just different, different traditions where something like a gator paw would be a bit more common and they come in and they see these and they get freaked out. I love those people. Those are some of my favorite customers. <laughs> I was like, if that freaks you out, come take a look at this. You know, um, yeah, you know, it's like, like, oh, how, how horribly can I traumatize this person before they leave the store today? Hey, let me um, take you out to see Ava. Yes, exactly. Let's introduce you to Ava. Uh, anyway, but, um, yeah, but this is something that would be like, I think in a lot of ways also like, I think a powerful focus for mm -hmm. your ritual work. Well, and, and these are just examples. Well, right? there, there are, are examples. so many things, in, so many things. In traditional witchcraft, you would usually have some sort of, um, animal bone or animal mm -hmm product um to represent the spirit of that animal yeah. hair or rabbit in traditional witchcraft is actually very prominent gator not so much but um uh but in traditional witchcraft all throughout the mediterranean in into like the uk there aren't a lot of alligators in the mediterranean not that i'm aware of oh, okay are there gators in the mediterranean i think they get crocodiles like kind of around like over closer to egypt oh yeah nile crocodiles yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but um and it's used to incorporate the spirit of that totemic energy into your practice. So you'll see a lot of witches that'll have um, like a rabbit's foot to represent hair or a hair foot to represent hair. Um, crow feathers or a crow skull. <sighs> anyway, animal components though can also be very powerful focuses for magic. Yes. Um, but again, a little, a little bit more of a kind of like a like more ingredient than tool. Yeah. Yes. Well, also, 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 extremely particular to to witch. Yeah. Right. To the to each individual witch, where some of these other things I think might be a bit more common. Yeah. You know, or they're kind of more uh, universal. Maybe that would be the better a better word for it. Yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah. Really, really, that's it for tools. So the only tools that we're really like, really. Like you have to have, like if you really are going into witchcraft, you need something to hold fire and you need pointy stabby. We do love to stab things as witches. And really those are the only things you're going to need. As you grow and you develop and your practice becomes more your own, what you're going to notice is going to happen is it's going to evolve and you might want to get a wand. You might need to get a, a chalice. You might need to do something else like that. And the thing is, is your practice should always evolve and it should always change because if it doesn't evolve and it doesn't change, then it becomes stagnant. And then you get into a point where you're like, I'm doing the same shit over and over and over again, and I'm like not happy about it, and so I'm just gonna stop. Um, or you go, I don't know what to do, and you sit there and you wring your hands, and then you just continue doing your own thing. And but be creative with the way that you apply concept, the concept of tools to your own practice. You know, yeah. we we're, we you know we've made the example of a wand, but you know what? Who maybe you don't want a wand, right? Like, or maybe you're in a situation um, like my grandmother. My grandmother, uh, the last uh, few years of her life, she she walked with a cane, and everybody knew like that cane. Oof. Uh, that was that was her wand in essence like that cane was powerful even after she died i that cane is in my house right now and people are afraid to touch it Man. um so you know so it, it could be a cane it could be a staff i personally think that we should bring like walking sticks and canes and things back into to fashion i would totally um, walk around with my blackthorn cane you know uh where we talk about a dagger i think i made the example i can't remember if it was on the podcast or if it was in a class but recently i made the example of somebody we know that actually uses just a big pair of scissors for, mm -hmm. a, for a ritual dagger mm -hmm. because they have a sharp point but they also cut yep right so. yeah right so yeah so don't be afraid to to put a little bit of imagination into some of these things yeah. you know as they apply to your own practice and um and keep it practical you know um the one thing that i think that we have uh we, we tell a lot of people in conversation when they come in looking for tools is to don't don't spend a whole lot of money don't go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff you know people get books that kind of tell you like you will you need these things right but 
ultimately you mm-hmm. do, you have to decide that yeah. right you well, decide if you need that you might go your entire practice and never need this you yeah. might never work with herbs or resins and you might never need this you know you might who knows right um purchase the things and utilize incorporate the tools that actually are going to make sense for what you want to yeah. do in your own practice well it's also always best to just kind of like make your own like it's always going to be better mm-hmm. if you make your own wand it's always going to be better i mean if you can forge your own knife cool or a cauldron cool um or i just go to uh sur la table and i buy like just a really fancy butcher's knife and then i glue rhinestones on the handle so it looks magic yeah that's what i do i was gonna george george is is pretty pretty crafty like george i want to forge he's a beautiful knife yes he has yes so um but really again just like your practice, your tools are your own. But really, if you're going to start down the path of traditional witchcraft or folk witch practice, then you want to make sure you have something that can hold fire and you want to make sure you have something that can cut things. Mm-hmm. Okay? And those are really the only things you need. Um, again, let your you let your craft develop. Let your tradition develop. Let your path develop. And let it be organic. Don't do it because someone tells you you need to. You know? Unless it's us. If we tell you you need to do something, you better do it. I mean, we've had people come into the, to the store all the time and they're like, I need all the tools to start witchcraft. And I'm like, I love that what tradition. Then I go over to the register and I kind of look at what our sales are at today. And like, if our sales are good, I'm like, no, 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 you really, you don't. Let's talk about this. But if the sales have been low, I'm like, you're right. You need everything. Mike's actually really not like that. No, no. No, in fact, I probably will be personally responsible for running our business into the ground because I talk people out of buying things um, that, that I feel they don't need. Um, anyway. I let people buy whatever the fuck they want. And if they want to buy it, and then I'm like, oh, you're going to be doing uh, the TikTok cord cutting spell. Well, I, I had one of those in the store That's tonight. not going to work, Oof. but I'm going to give you some things that's going to make it a little bit more effective for you. So here's some cat's claw. Here's a piece of obsidian. Make sure you use scissors. Here's some oil. And there you go. All right. Well, I think we have uh, yammered on long enough. Yammering. And we have another appointment to get you this evening. Yes, we do. Um, Before we um, leave, we do have some things coming up this week at the shop. Um, We have Ask a Witch happening tomorrow night. It is going to be a live stream um, on TikTok as well as Facebook. I do not know if we're going to be able to do the live stream on YouTube yet. don't think we are going to... We have the status yet. We are going to be... Yeah, we are going to be streaming or doing live streams to YouTube, but I think... I don't think... Based on YouTube's requirements, I don't think we're there yet. Okay. We're still growing. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So then like we'll... Like and subscribe. But soon, yes. Like and subscribe yes, so like that we subscribe. can do more things for you. And yes. it'll be good. So we have Ask a Witch happening tomorrow um, at 8 p.m. after the shop closes. 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Check your time zones. I get it. It's hard. But Google's your friend. Um, on top of that, uh, let's see. We have... Medusa. Medusa, the rights of the gods, vessels of the gods, Medusa coming That's up. That's the 22nd. Oh, sorry, it's not this week. Is it, oh, is it scheduled somewhere this week? week? No. It's, it's the scheduled. 22nd. I'm trying to remember what we have going I on this week. I just started that because I was on the that was all. Oh, God. I don't know. Go to the website, www.catandcauldron.com, and you'll be able to see a list of all yes, of our upcoming events. We have two events. ways for you to check our upcoming classes and events on the website. Yes. And you can also and you can always just check Facebook um, and our Instagram posts do have little tidbits about things going on in the shop. Send us send us messages. Yes, send, send us, us questions. Your, send us your listener questions and if you have a, a request for a particular topic, something you'd like to hear us talk about in depth, please send us that information. Yes. Um, if you are listening to us on Spotify, Please don't send a uh, voicemail. Please don't send a voicemail. We voice can't smell. figure that out. Spotify's uh, options for communicating back and forth with our listeners are becoming increasingly spotty. spotify E. So, so um, yeah, just like... So, yeah, so unfortunately... Email? Yeah, like, just, just send us an email or leave a comment on the episode if you need to, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but and we're everywhere. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're... Yeah. Salty Witches po- the Salty Witches Podcast at gmail.com is where you can find all of that information. Uh, well, not where you can find all that information, but that's where you can send your listener questions. That's where you can send episode ideas that you would what like is, us to do. What was that email address again? The Salty Witches Podcast at gmail.com. T H E S A L T Y W I T C H E S P O D C A S T dot. No, G- gmail. At gmail.com. Gmail. Okay, perfect. Okay. 
All I'm right. sure that'll probably be somewhere in the comments or some shit. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ashley. You the best. Um, so thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Hopefully we did not bore you too much tonight. And happy witching. Yes. Thank you.